Good morning, Christ Church. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here on the first Sunday after Easter. Yay! And it feels appropriate to still declare that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. My friends, welcome to Christ Church. My name is Pastor Beth Rambicure. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, welcome. We are thrilled to have you. We would like to invite all of you to everyone, including those of you who come regularly every Sunday, to fill out one of these cards and let us know that you are here today. Candy is using these cards to keep track of attendance in the office, and she said, will you please make a special announcement to let people know to fill those out? So I'm doing that this Sunday. Also, I wanted to let you know that on this little slip of paper, there's an opportunity for you to let us know what you would like to be involved with. Today we're going to be talking about the service of the church and the way the church lives into the resurrection. And if for some reason that sermon moves you to get more involved in your church community, you can just fill that little line there out and put it in the offering plate and we'll get a hold of you this week and find out how we can plug you in both to the Holy Spirit and to the service of the church. Also, we have places for you to share prayer requests. You can share both your private and public requests. Requests that are shared privately are prayed over by me in the office throughout the week. Requests that are shared publicly are prayed over by the church community in our church email. I believe that's all the announcements I have about this piece of paper. My next one has to do with United Women in Faith, formerly United Methodist Women. They are alive and strong, and this coming Wednesday, they are meeting at 1030 in the social hall for a special program on the history of the church. And afterwards, they will be going out to lunch at Jason's Deli. Did I get all that right, Kathy? Yes, awesome. So if you are a United Methodist woman or man or anybody, you are welcome to attend this time. It should be a lot of fun. My friends, I believe those are all the, oh, one last important announcement. We are using flowers today um, that we received from the family of Ginny Hubbard uh, after the memorial service. So a special thank you to Stephen, um, uh, Stephen, Cindy, and Tom, Mark. Mark, sorry about that, uh, for sharing with us those beautiful flowers, and please enjoy them throughout the service. And now, my friends, are there any other announcements that I have forgotten? Okay, hearing none other, here's the most important one. Let us worship together.
Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. And please remain standing for the hymn. join me in the opening prayer. God of abundance, we are thankful for the beauty all around us. Weave us together in a life full of goodness and joy. Help us to move in harmony with one another and with all of creation. Let us travel on your path toward release in your presence. Amen. And if you would uh, join with me in the responsive reading, Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore.
The Bible reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With the great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. My sermon today is called One Perfect Moment. And where I want to start today is when I think about perfection, it involves being with my family, with those that I love the absolute most, in usually some epic location, like the foothills of Mount Rainier, on a vacation which was paid for by anybody but me. <laughs> that would pretty much sum up what perfection would look like for me. But that's the thing about perfection, right? It's a completely individual experience. And so what I wonder is what does perfection look like for you? What would you say is your definition of perfection? If you had to describe it to your neighbor, which you're going to do in a second, <laughs> what? would that look like? So I want you to take a moment and turn to someone sitting next to you, or if you are an introvert like me and that's profoundly uncomfortable, you can always write notes to yourself. But I invite you to take a moment to share with someone what perfection looks like for you. Go. you to find a good stopping place in your conversation. Again, topic for lunch, right? And to share if you feel bold and you can shout real loud so I can hear you. And if multiple people say something at the same time, go ahead and try again. Um, what does perfection look like? A warm, a newborn baby. Oh my goodness, yes. Aww. <laughs> and then I feel that way about baby animals, like, right? Aww. <laughs> Except for maybe baby insects. I'm not super into that. All right, what else does perfection look like? Peace. World peace. World peace. Let's talk about dreaming big, right? Amen. Yes, indeed. What else does perfection look like? Okay, I heard Arizona sunrise. Amen, right? And then Elizabeth. Oh. <laughs> the 
the classical definition of perfection, not making any mistakes. I am definitely perfect all the time. Oh, oh no. What, here comes the lightning. No. What else? What else is perfection? <laughs> what is it? Ah, oh, that's right. Exactly. Your artwork, Brad, which is spectacular. Exactly. Yes. And indeed, you know, more people should tell us that our art is perfect because how many of us feel like I am not an artist? But the truth, right? Like all of you, you're just, but you all are artists just in the way you live your life. All right. Any other examples of perfection? Okay, excellent. I heard unconditional love, and then somebody cheated and read my sermon. Jesus! <laughs> exactly, right? Perfection is filled with so much. It is such a loaded term, and what it looks like absolutely depends on who you ask. It's like beauty, right? Our understanding of what is beautiful is shaped by what we believe to be good and important. What we understand to be perfect is shaped by what we think is right and virtuous and perhaps even what we think is holy. Now, United Methodism, which is part of the denomination you are practicing with today, surprise, we're a United Methodist Church. United Methodism had this founder named John Wesley, and back in the 1740s, he became convinced that there was something all of us move towards called Christian perfection. And now Christian perfection, as he read it throughout the New Testament, is our ability to love God fully, to be fully and completely in love with God, and so completely part of Jesus Christ, and so absolutely in tune with the Holy Spirit that our ability to live a Christian life became second nature. He believed that serving and loving and forgiving and giving and living with each other as if we were indeed of one heart and one soul, as Acts says today, was Christian perfection. It is the kind of perfection that Jesus speaks about when he calls his disciples in the book of Matthew to be perfect, therefore, as God is perfect. But how daunting is perfection? Those of us who strive for perfection in our daily lives when it looks like not making a mistake, that can be exhausting. And then when our idea of perfection is something as perhaps, I don't want to say unattainable, but difficult to attain as world peace, we might feel devastated that it's an ideal we can never quite reach. And yet, the idea of perfection in faith is a theme throughout the New Testament. It, ex it is explored perhaps most fully in the book of Hebrews, which sets out an argument for Christian perfection, beginning by looking back at those moments in our history in the, is, in the text of the Old Testament where we saw glimpses of perfection, and then pointing to Jesus Christ as the model of perfection, and then calling us to go on toward perfection by not falling away from our faith, but always drawing deeper and deeper into its challenges by engaging in its practices and wrestling with its meaning. Hebrews chapter 7 makes the point that it is only in Christ that we can achieve perfection. And this argument is brought to a close at the end of Hebrews in chapter 12 when the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. How many of you carry weight with you? And I'm not talking about what we gained at Easter, right? We walk around with tremendous amount of weight on our shoulders. The author goes on to say, and setting aside the sin that clings to us so closely, one understanding of sin are the ways in which we miss the mark, ways in which we are separated from God. How many of us experience something that pulls us off course or separates us from God? All of us, right? 
unless you're perfect. Okay, okay, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> and it finishes by saying, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Perfection in love is again taken up in the letter of First John when it goes on about Jesus loving and how we can achieve perfection in God by loving as Jesus loved, which calls us back to the Gospel of John where Jesus' final commandments to his disciples were, love one another as I have loved you. But of course, the challenge to perfection is being human. Nothing points to this better than the resurrection stories of Jesus. If you search the ends of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you hear story after story about the struggle to recognize the risen Christ. Jesus' entire ministry focused on the journey he was taking, and he said again and again that his journey on earth would end in the cross, but he would rise again, showing the power of God over death. And yet his disciples have no idea what to do with the resurrection. Each gospel has its own interpretation of this surprise and discovery, as we learned last week. That moment of turning our heart from fear and grief and disbelief to courage and joy and faith. Matthew, Luke, and John all record powerful stories of the women and the disciples making that turn as they discover the risen Christ and begin to be transformed in their lives by this discovery. And Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35, once again calls us into the power of that resurrection, what it looks like when people proclaim Christ risen. It is powerful, and it reminds us that not only is the resurrection our individual encounter with Christ, it is our community's engagement and encounter with Christ, where we answer the question, what does it mean to be a resurrection community? And of course, the answer is what we heard in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. The community is convicted by the grace of Christ, filled with the love of God and anointed with the Holy Spirit. And it looks like this, the body of Christ gathered in the world, living out Christian perfection. It feels when you read this part of Acts as if the disciples have finally arrived at the destination they set out for all those years ago when they met Jesus on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now at long last, a perfect harmony has settled upon the community of believers. I have been in church long enough to know that if I experience a day where everyone is of one heart and one soul, Jesus is coming back, right? <laughs> but here we hear that everyone is of one accord. They have one heart, one soul. Everyone shared all they had. Everyone owned everything together. I've tried owning things together with my sister. You know, when we were kids, it did not go well. But here it is. And the power in the testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus meant that grace was upon everyone. There was no need for people sold their land and their houses and they brought the proceeds and they laid it at the apostles' feet for general distribution. And just for a point of clarification, because I was in my 20s when I figured this out, apostles is the word we use to describe those 11 remaining living disciples of Jesus. Disciple then becomes the word for everyone else who comes to follow Jesus. So they're laying these proceeds at the apostles' feet for general distribution, and it is perfect. And that's where we see the words, and everyone lived happily ever after. Actually, no, you never see those words, right? Because it's the real world. 
And unlike those fairy tales we tell each other and live in stories, Acts is a real story about real people living with a real message in a world of conflict and destruction, in a world of violence and poverty and division, in a world where each person faced the same struggles and the same things that we face today. This this church description that we have here is the story of a community convicted by the risen Christ. But it is so powerfully countercultural that if we heard this story today in the news, we would probably hear members of a religious community selling off their homes and lands and giving their proceeds to their leaders as a cult. When we hear of people being of one heart and one soul, we think they must have been brainwashed. When we speak of the social distribution of wealth based on need, not based on merit or work, we think of those non-capitalist economic systems like socialism and communism and all the history and baggage those words bring with them. And yet, this is what the first church looked like. This is the model that's set forth in this one perfect moment in Acts for what a community perfected in the faith of Jesus Christ looks like. And it does look different than what we strive to do sometimes today. And so what do we do with this vision of the church? How do we embrace this message given to us here well, I think that answer lies in what it looks like for us again to meet the resurrection of Christ, to become part of this countercultural movement the way we do. We come together on Sunday. We declare God as ruler of all the world. We say, we say that in Christ there is peace. We believe that God will provide for our every need. We are engaging into this countercultural movement. And by standing as the disciples stood in our own fear and our own disbelief and grief, as we discover Christ reaching out to us in the life of another, saying, come with me, come and see. As we learn that same love that lives in Christ, when we serve one another, when we act together in prayer, when we sit together to listen to each other, we discover that Christ lives in us. And when we reach out in acts of grace and forgiveness and compassion and welcome, we are proclaiming with our lives that Christ is alive to all the world by calling on the Holy Spirit to enliven us and strengthen us and give us courage, we are indeed living into this perfect moment. When we experience this kind of community, these acts, perfection moments, when we glimpse and taste and know that we are part of what God is doing in this world through Jesus Christ, this is Christian perfection. And as this story reminds us, it is not just an individual pursuit. It is the work of the community, working together, striving together to embrace this story of the resurrection and all that comes with it. And so when we declare that we are an Easter people and we raise our voices, we become those whose eyes are open to the opportunities in this world to live into these perfect moments, to participate in this kind of perfection as we seek out ways to serve and to give and to love and to proclaim boldly with the living of our lives that Christ has risen indeed. So let us live in this perfection. Amen.
my friends, having sat together and shared with one another and thought about what it means to meet Christ in the resurrection, we have the opportunity now to rise and greet one another with signs of peace and welcome. Will you please rise and share the risen Christ with one another in the passing of the peace? And now, my friends, having shared that peace with one another, I invite you to turn to those who are joining us online and say a hearty, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And now, my friends, let us be seated as the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. Risen one, these are the gifts of we, your people, given so that we might indeed be part of your story, sharing with our lives and in all we do the power of your love, grace, and forgiveness. Use us and these gifts to further your kingdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people declared. Amen. Amen. My friends, you may remain risen. I just love saying that. You may remain risen as we join in celebrating communion together. In the United Methodist Church, communion is an act of grace that is given to us by God. This table is open to all people, regardless of membership or baptism. This table belongs to you. All that is asked is that you genuinely seek to be reconciled to those who are in relationship with you and seek the the grace of God. And so, my friends, let us declare together, the Lord be with you. 
lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Oh, it is right. And it is a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You shaped us from the dust of the earth and breathed into us life, forming humanity in your image. And so with your people on earth and the vast extensive company of heaven, we praise your name and sing their unending hymn, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and light, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, you gave birth to us, your church. You delivered us from the slavery of sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke it, offering it to each of his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Every time you eat, eat in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, Christ took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he offered it to each of his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant of grace poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for you and all the world. Every time you drink, drink in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered together and on these gifts of food and drink. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed and renewed by his love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. My friends, you may be seated as those assisting with communion come forward. I want you to know that all of our elements are gluten-free. If you need someone to bring communion to you, please remain seated. And after, after we serve those who have come forward, we will bring the plate to you. Let us feast together. in the spirits tether for when humbly in thy name Bob this is the blood of Christ given for you are met together Dick, this is the blood of Christ given for you in Gary, the, the midst of This is the body of Christ given for you. John Dare, the body of Christ given for you. Thy garments. Bob, the body of Christ given for you. Dick, the body of Christ given for you. As used to gather in the name 
of Christ to suffer, then with thanks to God the Father, break the bread and bless the cup. Alleluia, alleluia. Touch we kind our friendship up. All our minds and all our living make us sacraments of Thee. That by caring, helping, giving, we may true disciples be. Alleluia, alleluia, we will serve the faithfully.
Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, you're invited to rise as we sing our closing hymn, O Church of God United. another and share with me this benediction the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen and all god's people cried out amen you may be seated for the postlude